Chapter 45 I caught sight of Bear almost immediately. As he was so tall, his bald head all but gleaming, it was easy to follow him as he moved along the main street. Though his long strides kept him beyond my reach, I could follow without being observed. Being the feast of St. John the Baptist, a market day, the streets of Great Wexley were crammed with even more people than the day before. Every alley and lane was filled. The noise was deafening. I, who had every reason to stay unnoticed, was grateful for the crowds, and more so when I saw soldiers. Whether they were looking for me, or bear, or just keeping order, I didn't know. I only knew I must avoid them. Perhaps Bear saw them too, for now he plunged down a narrow side alley. I followed. Here, my pursuit proved harder, for he moved faster than before, turning this way and that, almost as if he knew I might be on his heels. Once, twice, I thought I lost him. Fortunately, his great height always gave him away. He had gone on in this fashion for some time when I saw him duck into a building. It was a large, timbered structure, three stories high, the second and third levels leaning far over the alley upon which it faced. On the first, street level, was a large, shuttered window. Over the door hung a board upon which an image of a boot had been painted. By this, I took it to mean that boots and shoes were made and sold there. At first I hung back, keeping my eyes on the door to see if Bear would re-emerge. He didn't, but a few other men went in, some of them, I thought, looking furtively about as they entered. It was as if they too feared being noticed. Nervous that Bear would be annoyed with me for disobeying his orders a second time, I decided not to go to him, but remained on watch my eyes alert for either the one-eyed man, soldiers, or men in blue and gold livery. But though the alleyway was full of passers-by, I saw no one that gave me any reason for concern. I was about to move on, with the thought of peeking through cracks in the building's front shutters, when another man appeared. A short man. He had a great dark cloak about him, hiding whatever clothes he wore. The hood concealed his hair. He, too, looked about, as if to make certain no one saw what he did. Then he entered the house. It was John Ball. There could be no more doubt that this was more of Bear's dangerous business, from which he had warned me to keep away. I had little doubt I'd not be welcome if he discovered I was close. Even so, my curiosity held me. As I passed the building, I discovered a narrow passageway running by its further side. Pausing, I looked about to make sure I was not being observed, then slipped within it. The passageway was narrow, but I easily made my way until I faced a rough stone wall. Having gone so far, I decided to climb it. From the top of the wall, I peered down into a small garden of flowers and herbs. The garden was surrounded by three walls built of rough stone, the walls being not much higher than the one I had just climbed. The back of the house served as the fourth wall. The place was deserted. I dropped down into it. Facing the rear of the building, I now discovered a back door had been left partially open. I started to move toward it, only to be arrested by the sound of a passionate voice which said, that no man or woman either shall be enslaved, but stand free and equal to one another, that all fees, obligations, and manorial rights be abolished immediately, that land must be given freely to all with a rent of no more than four pennies per acre per year. Unfair taxes must be abolished. Instead of petty tyrants, all laws shall be made by the consent of a general commons of all true and righteous men. Above all, our lawful king shall truly reign, but no privileged or corrupt parliaments or councillors. The church, as it exists, should be allowed to wither. Corrupt priests and bishops must be expelled from our churches. In their place will stand true and holy priests, who shall have no wealth or rights above the common man. The more I listened, the more startled I was that I understood what John Ball was saying, that he was, in fact, describing the way I had lived, and how it was wrong and could be made right. But as his words went on, I realized, too, how hazard this business truly was, nothing less than rebellion against the realm of England. Backing away from the door, I managed to climb the wall and moved hurriedly along the narrow alley toward the street. My intent was to return to the inn, there to await Bear and our departure from Great Wexley. Before stepping from the passageway between the buildings, I took the precaution of looking up and down the passage to see if I was being observed, which is how I spied a group of soldiers coming toward me along the street. They were such as I had seen by the town walls, armor on their chests and rusty metal caps on their head. Broadswords were in their hands, daggers were at their hips. They were being led by a man who wore a vest of chain mail over a quilted blue jacket. In his hands he carried a crossbow. His helmet bore a crest of blue and gold, but I knew him as John Acliffe. By his side was the one-eyed man.